So again, welcome to all of you dialing in to today's webcast, Within Reach, a conversation about achieving gender equity and diversity in leadership presented by our dynamic team of presenters from Deloitte. We have a few announcements to share. Um, so first, we're gonna talk about uh, the American College Financial Services Alumni Association. And this month we have been, we along with a lot of people have been celebrating Women's History Month. We've seen companies and organizations celebrating women's achievements and rallying for women's equality. At the Women's Center, we're thankful for the strong support of our leadership, our donors and partners, and hope we can count on adding all of you to our growing group of supporters. Philanthropic support for the Women's Center helps narrow the gap, the gender gap in financial services through applied research like this, events like this, and leading conversations on economic issues, inequalities, as well as the opportunities, which are so great in financial services for women. You can stand as an advocate for change for women in financial services by making a gift to the college at the womenscenter.theamericancollege.edu slash give. We also have um, some great news about a scholarship that we're offering. So we would be remiss if we didn't highlight an incredible op educational opportunity at the college. The Wealth Management Certified Professional Scholarship for the Advancement of Women in Financial Services is an unparalleled educational experience focusing on transforming the way you approach wealth management through applied knowledge. The scholarship is for women at any level or stage in their career in financial services interested in pursuing the WMCP designation. And those awarded the scholarship will have the full cost of the coursework for the designation covered completely, which is a $2,900 value. The course covers 150, 150 contemporary topics in five topic areas like life cycle, goal-based planning, efficient investment portfolios, financial instruments, and strategic wealth management to complex planning strategies. Those awarded the scholarship will go through the designation with a dedicated mentor from women in insurance and financial services. That way you'll have an opportunity to forge new relationships and you won't have to do it alone. There's still time to apply. The deadline is April 1st. And we encourage you to apply at theamericancollege.edu slash scholarships. Now for the final bit of housekeeping, if you have questions throughout the discussion, please enter them in the QA function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, I am so excited about our guests today. I met Allison and her colleagues at Deloitte early in my tenure at the college. I found their research online and they have been such a great resource to me and to the Women's Center. They're generous and knowledgeable and I'm so pleased to be able to share their research and insights with our alumni and friends. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed panel of Deloitte presenters, Allison Rogish, Netta Shemluck, and Sam Freeman. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Hillary. What a lovely welcome. Thank you so much for having us here today. And thank you to everyone on the line. Uh, Netta, Sam and I are just delighted to be here with you and delighted to be talking about this topic that means so much to us. So we're looking forward to sharing our data with you. Let's jump right in and we'll walk through our agenda on the next slide. So today we're going to talk about a few topics. First, we thought we would talk about why it's so important for us at Deloitte to perform this research. Really, we wanna talk about our call to action. Second, we'll talk about what our analysis revealed, which actually is a compilation of three different studies we performed. One was a study that we performed related to the overall composition of executives in the C-suite and senior leadership roles within the financial services industry. Our second study was an investigation into a subcategory of the C-suite that we're calling emerging leaders. And then our third study uh, analyzed the path to CEO in financial services and uh, analyzed some implications for women. So after we review the results of those studies, we'll leave you with some key considerations for enabling greater progress for women in leadership roles. And of course, we'd love to hear the questions you all have on this topic as well. So on the next slide, why did we decide to embark on this research? Well, we believe that we are at a perfect storm for change. There is broader societal focus on diversity and social justice issues, yet there's been limited progress, 
yet higher number of women's, women are leaving the workforce. And all of this is wrapped up in a pandemic. So it's coming together to really create a call to action regarding gender equity in financial services. And, and we at Deloitte were, were very eager to offer our own perspectives on this topic. More broadly, Deloitte as a firm has a rich history in shaping corporate America's inclusion landscape since 1993, when we became the first professional services organization to establish women and diversity focused initiatives. And so really continuing our research effort on this front is a natural extension of our history and our commitment to help other companies capitalize on the power of diversity. I should note that we did this research in coordination with 100 Women in Finance. Some of you may be familiar with that organization. It's one of the leading global women's affinity organizations for the financial services industry. And that partnership has really been fantastic uh, to, to expand our thinking. And I also wanna point out that as we developed our research, we were very intentional, not only with the title of our report, which is within reach, but also the punctuation in the terms of that question mark, because it's not immediately apparent that gender equity and financial services is within reach without some significant commitment and action. So moving on to the next page, if we just take a quick step back, the case for organizational diversity has never been more compelling. As has been well publicized and well researched, diversity within firms has been shown to drive innovation and increase productivity. Gender diversity at the leadership level in particular has even been linked to boost in profitability. So it's no wonder then that 34% of CEOs recently ranked diversity and other social impact indicators as key measures of success when evaluating firm performance. But frankly, as we move to the next slide, the reality is that achieving a greater share of women in leadership roles remains elusive and a challenge for many firms. And the numbers alone should, should spark a call to action because while women and men are nearly equally reflected in the US labor force, the representation of women dwindles significantly higher up we, we rise, they rise in leadership ranks. In fact, women account for a mere 5.4 of CEOs in S&P 500 companies. Furthermore, representation equity in leading lines of business and in risk-taking roles often lags meaningfully across financial services. And women, we still only manage single digit percentages of client assets. And so while unfortunately many firms, well, fortunately many firms have instituted diversity and inclusion initiatives, unfortunately the hard truth is that many traditional programs have not led to significant acceleration in the share of women in leadership. So on that less than happy note, and before we get into more details about our research, let's move to our first poll question. So we're curious to hear from you all. In the last two years, what level of focus has your organization put towards diversity and inclusion efforts? Would you say a low level, a moderate level, a high level, or you don't know or prefer not to answer? And I'll give you all a minute to think and submit. Perfect, thank you, Emily. Well, so I am delighted to see that it looks like almost 60% of your organizations are putting a high level of focus on diversity and inclusion. And if we were to add that with the moderate level, I mean, we're well north of 75, 80%. So that's really fantastic. And it is certainly something that we've seen at Deloitte, um, not only through our clients, but frankly, what we're doing ourselves is we're looking at how Deloitte operates as an organization. And so we'll talk more about um, what different firms have been doing as we move forward throughout the presentation. So let's just move on a little bit more about our research. So obviously there are multiple aspects to diversity. For our research service, for our research series, we focus on gender equity and leadership roles in financial services. And specifically to perform our research, we had a quantitative uh, analytical stream where we analyzed more than 100 large US financial services institutions to assess how women have fared in leadership roles since 1998. And these companies span across sectors. They include banking and insurance, investment management, real estate, and payment providers. And then to complement that quantitative analysis, we added a qualitative element whereby we hosted a virtual forum of executive women leaders to obtain their insights on the path to leadership. And I really appreciated this element of our research because these were the stories and the humans behind our data. 
These women shared their input on the programs and networks they have found most valuable, the leadership styles and skills they believe are needed to meet the future business environment, and their personal experiences on the what and who have motivated them and inspired them throughout their careers. And so if we move on, there's one more element of our research that I wanted to point out is that we looked more deeply at the women in leadership idea and broke that concept into three categories. Specific, specifically, we looked at the following segments of leaders. So first, we looked at the C-suite, which is kind of the classic traditional C-suite elements of CEOs, CFOs, CIOs, CHROs, etc. Then we also looked at senior leadership roles, which we defined as those executives who are one to three levels below the CEO, and they're often the lines of business heads, EVPs, SVPs, the exact title might um, vary depending on the organization. But then we also explore the concept of the emerging C-suite roles, which we defined as C-suite roles that have emerged roughly since the 2008 global financial crisis. And these are those newer roles that are like the chief sustainability officer, the chief innovation officer, chief data officer, et cetera. And we're gonna find some really interesting findings related to all of those uh, different leadership. With that context set, Sam, why don't I hand it over to you to share the key points of our research? Thanks a lot, Allison. Um, you know, so what did we actually find with all this research, right? So we're gonna start at the top level and then we're gonna explore the various categories that Allison just walked us through. And as she mentioned, there's some, I think there's some good news here and there's a lot of work left to be done, right? And, and we're gonna try to specify for you areas of opportunity uh, areas where the industry seems to be doing interestingly well and others where things could be better. So why don't we go to the next slide and, and get started. And what we see here is definitely slow progress, right? I think most of us on this call would think this is way too slow. You know, the percentage of women in leadership roles across all the categories that Allison described, you know, it's grown from about 15.6% back in 1998 so we're looking at you know a little over 20 years and it's only up to just about 22%. Not exactly, uh, you know, it's not exactly a, a rocket soaring uh, into the sky here. It's more like a very, very slow lift. Uh, and you know, the, if you take a look even at the rate of growth, like where there, was there a spike or anything like that, a little bit of an uptick around 2013 up to the present time but nothing dramatic, right? It didn't go from like 15% to 20% in two years or something. It still took, even then it took, you know, a good amount of time. Uh, and, you know, the, a lot of this, a lot of that growth even may have been accounted for by the growth in the number of C-suite titles. You know, like back in 1998, a lot of the titles that we've identified as emerging didn't exist. So not only did women not have an opportunity to have these titles, nobody had them. It was a much smaller group of people. So what you'd hope for is as you look over a 20 year period uh, where these emerging roles uh, came into the, into the forefront and they've been multiplying uh, quite frequently over the last few years, you'd think women would really sort of skip up there in this, in the, in this data because the opportunity to enter the C-suite is much bigger than it ever was before because the C-suite has been widened. As you can see here, I mean, again, so, you know, six point growth in 20 years is not exactly, is not exactly terrific. So, you know, and it, this is gonna be interesting how this plays out. So we were saying to ourselves, well, let's start projecting this and see what might happen over the course of this decade if the financial services institutions that we've been following uh, didn't do much more than what they are already doing today, right? Let's just assume for the sake of argument, this is the rate of growth. If we go to the next slide, you will see that, you know, by the end of the decade, okay, we're finally seeing a spike, right? It goes from almost 22% to 31%. That's better progress, right? But even at that point by 2030, which is still a ways off, we're just below a third of uh, the percentage of women in these leadership roles. So it's much better. Obviously it's twice 1998's total, right? But 
wow, you're talking about, you know, a 30 year timeline there. That's, you know, so that's, you know, going from 15 to 30 is, uh, is still not as fast as I think many of us would like, right? Now, here's the, here's the thing that really got to us. Uh, literally, let's go off the charts for a minute, right? Let's say this is only to 2030. How long would it take at this rate of growth for there to be 50-50 women and men in these leadership roles? We projected it out as 2085. I said, whoa, you know, that's, that's real. I won't be around, I don't think, in 20. I would love to, but I don't think I will be. Um, and I know earlier we were talking about Women's History Month, and this is always, I'm a, I'm a history buff, especially American history. And I know last year when we uh, first started doing these, uh, these readouts, it was the, the 100th anniversary of the passage, you know, the adoption of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Uh, I had read a terrific book about that, incredible effort that went into securing that last state of Tennessee, which if you didn't know, won by one precarious vote by a, a lawmaker whose arm was really twisted by his mom to do the right thing. And you know, this was, it was a really interesting story. And then it also recapped the whole history of the, the, uh, you know, the suffrage movement, uh, movement. And I learned that you know, the amendments passage, it started with that women's rights conference way back in 1848. So it took 70 years from the start of the movement to actually adoption of the amendment. So, and that's sort of a similar time frame we're seeing here to get to 50%, right? Let's hope it doesn't take that long and see let, what can we do to accelerate that curve? We'll so let's by... just, Sam, can I interrupt? So sure. we've had a couple of questions from the audience. Sure. And um, I'm not sure if you've done these projections, but if we really want to get to 50% to mirror the population and we want to compress that time frame, and we don't want to take as long as it's taken since you know the First Amendment um, efforts began, how long reasonably could will it take or what rate do we need to get us to 50%? If we could accelerate that rate and we could all kind of put our shoulders into it, um, what kind of growth rate would we need? You know, I don't, I don't know offhand. It's certainly, you know, I, it, it's certainly faster than this, right? To go, you'd have to more than double where we are now, right? So if you're, even if you get like five percentage points per year, it's still going to take quite, quite a bit of time. But I think we can do better than 30, 31%. You know, maybe we can get it up to 40, 42. And I think a lot of the elements we're going to talk about over the course of this webcast We'll put in place some of the elements that that can really step on the gas and get women further ahead uh, in terms of uh, you know taking their fair share of the leadership positions in the business. Not because then, it you have to have 50-50, but because you know there are there are women, many women out there who really deserve this opportunity. And for a variety of reasons that we'll go over, they may not be you know in a position to get the kind of uh, growth that we uh, that we'd like to see. All right, and just a point of clarification, my understanding is that this is part of your gender series. Indeed. And, mm -hmm. not, and this does not break down necessarily um, by race. Do you have any breakdown by race in any of your practice? I can wait. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Allison, do we, where do we stand with that? With that? Yeah. I don't think we've done studies on that yet, right? Do you want me to chime in? Yeah, uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, so um, you're right, Hillary, this was focused primarily on gender. Interestingly, we also are interested on the data around the intersection of race and gender. And so we are currently working on our next report, which is looking at that intersection of race and gender uh, in financial services leadership. Um, the numbers right now, based on what's publicly available, are staggeringly low. So low single digits in terms of women of color uh, in leadership positions. And that's true kind of across industries, unfortunately. Great, thank you. Thanks, Netta. So if we go to the next slide, we're gonna take a look at a, a couple of categories, try to bifurcate this a bit from, uh, you know, the C-suite versus what uh, Allison described as sort of the next generation of C-suite leaders, the, the senior leadership folks. And you see there's a gap between those in the C-suite and those who are uh, in senior, senior leadership roles of about, you know, almost eight points. Uh, you know, that's unfortunate because you want to see a higher level of women in the senior leadership roles, because that's obviously 
women aren't going to appear in the C-suite out of thin air. They're going to be trained and cut their teeth in, in lower level senior positions. So the feeder system is lacking right now a little bit. So it's not just a matter of the C-suite. You have to think in terms of throughout your whole organization and how you're going to go about you know, fortifying this. Um, that's the next generation of leaders. And there's, there's a very important statistic I'll refer to in a couple of slides, which shows how important uh, you know, these two elements are in terms of their correlation. If we go over to the next slide, what you'll see is if we, again, we're gonna to try to project this through to 2030. And actually, you know, while there's some growth there in the, in the senior leadership area, uh, you know, we actually, you know, we see that um, you know, this gap is still, um, you know, is still increasing here, right? So there, there could still be a talent gap here because this is where you're gonna draw the next generation of leaders. And it's great that, uh, you know, maybe some of these, uh, you're just taking a higher percentage of people that are, you know, that are going up. Um, you know, the senior leaders are still lagging there. And, you know, so when, you, when these organizations focus on trying to get gender equity, you can't just focus on C-suite titles. You have to think about, you know, unless you're gonna, you're prepared to go outside your industry entirely, which is an option that we discuss a little later. Doesn't always always have to be financial services people in some of these roles, but uh, there is a gap there that uh, one way or the other is gonna is gonna have to be addressed, right? So if we go to the next slide, you know, this was sort of one of the more interesting elements that we revealed in our research, and. You know, we were looking at the impact of having women in the C-suite on those lower level roles, right? Like what is the presence of women in organizations that have higher, you know, C-suite, uh, you know, higher C-suite titles? And what we saw is this multiplier effect is what we're calling it. We found that with each additional woman added to the C-suite as we laid it out in Allison's description earlier, there were three additional women in, in the senior leadership roles. And that sort of makes sense because the more women you have in visible positions of authority in the higher levels of the company, uh, where they're in a position also to influence hiring decisions and promotion decisions and such, you're going to see a little bit more of a ripple effect where uh, no matter how mean, you know, well-meaning the men are in the organization, having you know, more women in the higher level roles also tends to equate with having more women at the next level of leadership roles. And that's a, uh, you know, that's a, that's a very important point. And we're gonna revisit that a little bit later when we talk about steps like mentorship and sponsorship. So we wanted to flag that for you. If we can go to the next slide, let's take a look at the idea of emerging leaders, right? And by no means are we trying to minimize or, you know, sort of like uh, uh, discriminate in any way that, you know, well, a CFO is a real C-suite title and a CSO is not. The reason why they've been appointing more C-suite titles is because governance today, management today is increasingly challenging. And they realize that you need a broader spectrum of senior leaders to take on these responsibilities, right? But as you'll see in the, you know, further down in, in, our, um, in our presentation, there has been an effect in terms of how you get to the highest leadership post and what type of career path you follow. But if you see here, you know, you're looking at the, the notion that uh, the traditional C-suite roles, right, which is that bottom level there, is uh, definitely not drawing as many higher percentage of women as the emerging C-suite roles. And as you'll see in a moment, there's some, there's some clear winners here in terms of what positions are drawing more women than others. This may be a way, uh, you know, in the organizational thinking where they've appointed a new role and they think that, well, here's a great opportunity to diversify our leadership team. Let's put a woman in that role. Or it could just be that there's more opportunity for women to move up from the middle leadership ranks. And rather than just that tight knit group of traditional C-suite leaders, now they have, uh, you know, a greater opportunity of more, you know, more numerous titles that they can aspire to, to get into that C-suite role. So, um, you know, if you get into the next slide here, now we're gonna talk about, well, what are these emerging roles? And I, I just love this one, diversity and inclusion, 87% are women. So we have a problem with diversity and inclusion, let's put a, person, a woman in charge of it. That seems to make some inherent sense, but it also seems to be a very easy ask, right? It's like, 
it's two for one. You know, we have, you know, we're addressing the issue and we have a woman in the role. So, you know, we've, we've gotten two benefits out of this. If you look at some of the other elements there, you know, it's like uh, the people that are in charge of like continuing development, sustainability is a big issue now, right? Innovation is coming on. Then you get down to some of the other areas here. Strategy, very important role, right? As chief strategy officer, it's only one out of four for women, right? If you get down to transformation, a huge element of the financial services business now, whether you're talking about technology transformation, data transformation, customer experience, all these elements, right? Women are still very underrepresented, even in those emerging roles. So if you flip those, that means like on transformation, that means nine out of 10 people leading transformation efforts at a company-wide level are actually men, not women. So, and we can't quite figure out why that is, but it's just something people should be aware of, right? And then last but not least, if we go to the next slide, this, was a, this is a bit much to digest, I know. So I'm gonna try to walk this through, walk you through this in a few minutes here. We, we looked at the path to CEO at those 107 companies that we studied in the financial services business. What was their CEO in the prior two roles before they got their job, right? And then we also looked at, you know, this is sort of the heart of the challenge facing many of, uh, you know, the women who aspire to the CEO level, and not all do, and not all men do, right? But the idea is, if that's your goal, if you really want to run the whole shebang, you know, what, how do you position yourself to do this? And we, what we wanted to understand is, you know, what is the career path there? So we looked at this, and if you look at the, uh, at the right-hand column, right, uh, you see that uh, there is a definite bias towards a certain number of roles. There are three major talent pools that CEOs of these organizations were drawn from. It was line of business leaders, it was heads of finance, and it was heads of operations, COOs, CFOs, right? Um, and note, please, uh, all these numbers don't add up to 100 because obviously we're looking at two prior roles. So they, they do, uh, you know, the numbers is in a 100% situation. If you go over to the left-hand column, on the other hand, what you see is the distribution of just in general, the senior leadership roles in these categories. And you see, wow, line of business takes up half of these leadership roles, right? And the others are much more, um, you know, much, much, much more minor in terms of numbers. But the middle column is the one we really is the, is the money shot here for us, right? This is the one that talks about uh, the share of women leaders in these particular roles. And if you match up uh, you know, the, the right-hand column, which is where CEOs are coming from, with the middle column, which is where women in leadership are, are tending to, uh, you know, be congregated, you'll see that uh, outside of maybe finance, where, uh, you know, women are, are definitely making some headway, uh, where about one in five women hold senior positions in finance, uh, you see a lot of women in leadership roles that are very important. It's marketing and business development. It's talent areas, right? Nothing wrong with those areas, except if you want to be CEO, these are not the spots that are considered the stepping stones to the CEO role. Now, when we talked about this in our report, uh, we did uh, suggest the need to cultivate and give, more, give women more opportunities along the leadership tracks in the three big pools from where the CEOs are being drawn. And it does make sense, right? The person in charge of finance really knows the, the, you know, the money aspect of the company. The one in charge of operations really knows what's going on at the gut level. A line of business leader is someone who's already led a particular division or function. So they may be positioned to step up and lead the whole company. So that does make sense. So if you want more equity from a gender standpoint, it is time to start thinking of either recruiting or preparing more women for those three pools. But on the other hand, we also suggested widening the lens so that CEOs are considered from you know, other types of roles other than these top three. Technology is a huge factor. Might a CTO someday be a CEO uh, in, in such a digital driven company, right? Uh, talent is such a huge aspect of it, uh, you know, the human capital position. So you know, might, uh, I think we found one CHRO, former CHRO had become a CEO. Uh, and it was like two levels below that. But these are very interesting dynamics. I think it underscores some of the details behind the top line numbers we showed you earlier that deserve a little bit more focus and attention on the part of leadership, uh, both at your organizations and at the industry as a whole. Now, I know that 
we gave you a lot there. That's like drinking from a fire hose a bit. So let's take a breath for a second, do our second polling question. And then we'll go into more depth about, you know, what we're doing about this, what we can do about this. So which of these research findings that you see here is the most surprising to you? Is it the growth rate of women in leadership over the last two decades? Was that a surprise? It was so slow. Is it the emergence of these new C-suite roles being predominantly occupied by women? Is it the multiplier effect? Does that surprise you? Or is it the share of women in roles that lead uh, more naturally to the C-suite? And I'll, I'll give you a second there, but let me bring uh, Netta in. Netta's gonna take our next section. Uh, do we have a do we have a question from the we audience? We do, Sam. We, we do. Actually, oh, I'm sorry. Go for it. Yeah. While well, we're waiting for the poll to be answered, so um, back on slide 12, the percentage mm -hmm. of women in senior leadership hasn't kept pace with women in the C-suite. So the gap was pretty big between 27 and 20 percent or thereabouts. But if you look back on the chart between 2008 and 2010, the lines almost kissed. They got very very close. And Tanya asked what was happening in the industry that the gap was so close there. So that was one of the questions. And then um, whoever can answer that. And then the book that you referenced, the book name and author. Oh, yes. Everybody wants oh, that if you could, if you gosh. could name that. I'm gonna have, I'd have to get it off my Kindle. I will look it up while Ned is doing her presentation. Okay, we'll, we'll it was make a sure we send it in It's the a wonderful email. book. And actually Hillary Clinton's production company has optioned it for a TV miniseries. So I'm looking forward to that. It was just a wonderful story. It was, even though like, you know the outcome, you know it's gonna pass, it was gripping. As far as the first question, uh, Netta, you were nodding your head. Do we, have a, do we have a point of view on that? We actually, it's interesting. That's around the couple years that followed the financial crisis, but it is unclear from our data what caused and what is um, causing this lower percentage of women in leadership roles over the past roughly decade or so. And that's where we saw kind of that, that line kind of level off. So um, unfortunately, no correlation that we can attribute, um, but it's a question that we can ask them as well. All right, thank so you. So here we have, yeah, the findings here. Uh, it looks like the growth rate, 40%, but not far behind the share of women in roles leading to the C-suite. Um, you guys aren't surprised about the multiplier effect. I'm, I'm sort of glad to hear that because you understand then the importance of having women in senior leadership positions in you know, recruiting and developing more women at the lower leadership level so that they can uh, someday be uh, C-suite people. And um, you were not surprised about the emergence of roles uh, that are new that are occupied by women. Uh, perhaps that's your own personal experience. But with this, I'm going to turn it over to Netta, who's going to talk about some of the, uh, you know, the ways that we might address uh, these disparities. Netta? Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. And thanks, Allison and Hillary, for teeing this up. Um, so first and foremost, I'm happy to be here with you all. Women in leadership is a huge passion of mine. Um, and it's only been amplified over the past year in large part because we are seeing more and more women drop out of the labor force. So um, it's important to know we've just shared this research with you. Uh, this research actually predates the pandemic. And so uh, some of these numbers I think will have uh, actually dropped off. Um, on the flip side, we're seeing some silver linings as well. So um, let's start with the bad news. The bad news is that we are seeing the lowest percentage of women's participation in the workforce since 1988. That's 33 years um, because so many women have left the workforce this year to care for families. Um, the silver lining to this is we're seeing such great pressure and that comes in the form of investors and regulators and consumers to drive greater diversity in leadership and we're seeing a lot of firsts. Um, and so I know many of us on this call got very excited to see Jane Frazier as an example, be named as CEO of Citi, the first woman to lead a major US bank. We now have a handful of women CEOs leading uh, insurance companies as well. But as Sam and Allison have, have spoken to, there's a lot more work to be done. And to start, you know, if there's something I like more than data, it's change. <laughs> so. To start, you know, one of the first steps organizations need to take is truly to improve the transparency and accountability. And this was consistent feedback we heard amongst the women executives who participated 
in our crowdsourcing panel. Um, you know, to be able to actually measure and understand the metrics um, would be the first step. And the second piece is to establish an ambition that you're working towards and hold people accountable to that change. So we are seeing, um, you know, a lot of regulatory agencies kind of weigh in on this front. Um, states take action as well. So the House Subcommittee on Diversity is an example has asked financial services institutions to not only publicly share their diversity policies, but also for greater transparency and uh, with respect to diversity in leadership. Um, and even more recently, we've seen California mandate that they have at least one woman uh, on a public company board um, if that company is headquartered in, uh, in California. And then in just the past few months, we saw Adina Friedman, who's the CEO of NASDAQ, uh, petition to have companies listed in the NASDAQ have at least one woman and one diverse member of the board. So we're seeing this dynamic shift take place um, in part within financial services, but more broadly across these industries uh, as people push for greater diversity um, and that transparency and accountability uh, is in line with that. So if we can flip to the next slide. Another thing that is really critical, um, and again, especially right now, is for organizations to acknowledge that women's career paths are not linear. Um, so almost half of working moms, and this is a pre-pandemic stat, um, pause their careers at some point. And so for financial services companies, it's really critical to have uh, programs to relaunch women's careers, help them re-enter the workforce, recognizing that a good percentage of women uh, will take that uh, pause. Just in this past year, uh, this has grown as a much greater issue as we've seen 3 million women leave the workforce. And so I think this is an area where we're gonna see a lot of momentum, um, but it's an area that also you know, has a lot of opportunity. So Goldman back in 2008 was the first financial services company to establish a re-entry or relaunch program um, and there are several other kind of big financial services companies that followed suit. So JPMC has a program, Bank of America has a program. Um, but when we looked at the data and we looked at the Bloomberg Gender Equality Index, what we found was that of the 230 companies listed in there, only one third had a formally established reentry program. And so um, again, in light of just seeing the drop off in women over the past year, finding a way for those women to come back um, and allowing for a more seamless transition back into the workforce is gonna be important. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so within an organization, um, the power of networks is very real and that support comes in many forms. So to start, maybe I'll give you the distinction that between mentorship and sponsorship, um, and that is, a mentor is someone who talks with you, someone who gives you advice and counsel. A sponsor is someone who talks about you behind closed doors, positions you for opportunities and champions and advocates for you. And I had a close colleague actually who recently made a really good point. She said, you know, it's really important to know who your mentors and sponsors are and who in your network is not. And I thought it was great counsel because, you know, women early in their careers have a lot of mentors, they're getting a lot of advice, a lot of counsel, and that's really critical in those early days. Down the line as women progress in their careers, and again, this came up in our, in our um, panel, that sponsorship is critical. It's not just the people to give you advice, but being able to identify who has taken a risk on you um, and be able to uh, have them advocate for you and champion for you to get into leadership positions um, is really important. And this is really where the role of men has been critical uh, as well. And um, I saw, I was scanning through the attendees and I saw Alan and Edward and Gary. And so I wanna thank the men who are on the line as well, because you know, oftentimes the people who are championing for women to get into these leadership roles are the people who are in positions of power. And the reality is the vast majority of those who are in power in financial services organizations today is men. And so they play a critical role in advocating um, for women as well. And then finally, peer networks here should not be overlooked. So internally, 
it's being able to find others who are facing similar challenges, get their kind of advice, counsel perspectives, and then externally being able to connect with peers who maybe work in other organizations for that fresh perspective. But if you look at women who ended up securing the highest ranking positions within organizations, uh, it was noted that they were well-connected within their peer network and also had strong ties to other well-connected women. So uh, we can't underestimate the power of the peer network as well. All right, next slide, please. So finally, it goes without saying, we need more women CEOs. As Sam talked about earlier, you know, of the top 100 financial services organizations, almost all CEOs were male, um, and most all came from line of business or finance roles. And so um, either we need to get more women into the succession pipeline for the line of business and finance roles. And interestingly, the women who have made CEO in this industry traditionally have come from those roles. So Jane Frazier, as an example, is often cited. She was among the 9% of women who had a line of business leadership role. Um, and so either we need to get more women into that succession pipeline, or the alternative is to widen the lens for what is a pipeline to a CEO role. And is are there other roles um, outside of the CFO role or the line of business role that could be deemed um, qualified for a CEO position? Um, and Sam touched on this earlier, but succession planning is critical to feeding that pipeline. There was a really interesting HBR article uh, a couple years back that referenced a two in the pool effect. So a lot of companies a few years back started to um, really focus on having either one woman or one kind of underrepresented minority included in their succession pipeline. And statistically, the odds of that woman or underrepresented minority getting the role were significantly lower almost zero when there was one of them. Uh, when there were two, the odds actually went up considerably. And so being able to have a more diverse pipeline um, for these executive roles is gonna be critical as well. So let me pause there and let's go to the next polling question. So I think this is our final polling question. Which strategy do you think could have the biggest impact on growth of women in leadership roles? Sponsorship and mentorship, Reentry programs, improved transparency and accountability, or allyship or menace allies. And Hillary, any questions that we got while we're waiting? Yeah, so I think you touched on one of the questions that was submitted from one of our um, participants ahead of the com the conversation was, "How has the pandemic impacted your findings?" And I think you touched on that about the massive 3 million women left the workforce amidst the pandemic because of other obligations, family and otherwise, um, but you talked about the silver lining. So I think that's, that's positive. And then what are some of the qualities that leaders will likely need in the future given these changes? And some of the things that come to mind are, um, all of us are now Zoom experts. Um, mm -hmm. So technology and digital, I think some of us have, have achieved new skills there. And I, as I read your research, um, one of the terms that you used is consensus building, which I think yep. is, is hugely, especially in a decentralized fashion where we're not all together. Um, so maybe you can talk about some of those qualities leaders will need in future. Yeah, Allison, do you wanna weigh in here with yeah, some of our yeah. observations on that? Yeah, absolutely. Because we actually did a human capital trends survey pre-pandemic. Um, and even at that time, Hillary, a lot of the um, characteristics that were noted as necessary for leaders of the things that we're dealing with right now, right? Able to um, communicate across boundaries, um, leading through complexity and ambiguity, leading through influence, managing remotely. I mean, it was like a script for, you know, what we're all dealing with now, um, leading through quick decision making. And so we had, uh, that all kind of came out of a, of a Deloitte study a while ago maybe a year ago or so. And then that was further reinforced through our panel um, because they also spoke a lot about the importance of relationship oriented skills. They talked about being strong communicators and connectors who can unite and motivate people to action quickly. So, you know, those were the things that we heard in the data. If we take it one step further, 
women happen to be particularly good at those skills. So uh, HBR did a study where they said, okay, uh, out of you know 19 leadership characteristics, very much focused on those that I just described, women actually came out on top out of 17 out of those 19 characteristics. So you know, it's kind of our time, I think, and there makes a lot of sense for us to continue the, the path to reach these senior levels. Um, but obviously that's not without its challenges, particularly based on what we've all focused on and faced over the last year. Yeah, we read a lot of the same research, Allison. <laughs> Good stuff. Awesome. Okay. And I was gonna say, yes, yeah, so this, the answers to this question that are very interesting, right? So it looks like everybody wants, you know, they really, really would appreciate, you know, as you're climbing the ladder, reach back, right? Yep. and help somebody up behind you the it's pretty overwhelming the the idea of having somebody in your corner to you know sort of shepherd you through uh help you network introduce you around get you access to more senior people um you know make sure that uh, you benefit from their experience in terms of what it takes to get ahead uh, the idea of sponsorship and mentorship that's it's such an important thing Absolutely. Can we talk a little bit about like how you develop that? I mean, is that this doesn't happen spontaneously, right? That I know you have some people for either men or women, some people are really good mentors and coaches. Other people, it's like dog eat dog. And, you know, I don't want that kid to get my job to hell with them. Right. Yeah. So uh, how, do, how do you develop like these sponsorship and mentorship arrangements? You know, I think the first step is to be very deliberate and aware of it, right? So I remember I would refer to early days in my career and I used to say, you know, I always had someone who took me under their wing. Turns out we would now define that person as a sponsor, someone who took risks on me. But it's being able to identify and be deliberate about it. So people come and go out of organizations. Some people will have strong sponsors for a couple of years and then see those executives leave and or lose power with or influence within their organization. So being very cognizant of, am I not only getting the advice and support, but am I also having people who are taking risks on me? If I'm not, who can I align myself with? And really it comes down to being able to showcase your value to that person, right? They're not taking risks on you just because you know, you're asking them for permission to do so, but rather um, because it is value accretive to them, right? They're putting their political capital on the line for you. And so being very thoughtful about that over the course of your career um, is important. And we actually have a podcast. I think we're gonna flip to the next slide where we talk about um, some of the other kind of assets we have. We have a podcast specifically on this topic of mentorship and sponsorship within financial services and the role that each play um, and a whole host of other kind of um, as well, showcasing the personal journeys. You know, here we talked about the data, but I think the stories are equally powerful. Um, and so we have several uh, C-suite executive women like Andrea Smith from Bank of America, who's the chief administrative officer, Yi Shin Hung, who is the uh, CEO of MetLife Investment Management and others who talk about, you know, what did their path look like? What were the hurdles they faced? Um, and their hope, to your point, of being able to lift up that next generation of women. So hopefully of course, you get a chance. It also that starts out. at the top, right? I mean, Absolutely. there has to be has to be an emphasis from senior leadership that they're expected to mentor, not just women, but you know, all the younger people on staff. It's it's got to be yeah. part of the the business strategy within the organization is that we're constantly developing our talent and we're not doing that just with you know, CPE webcasts and stuff like that. We need hands-on people to be there for them. Sam, I'm so glad you said that because I was going to double click on that, what Netta said about sponsorships. In my mind, a sponsorship relationship, the onus is on the sponsor, right? Who am I going to help? Like, who are those people who I really see a lot of promise in who will am I willing to put my own capital on and it is you know it has to be accretive to both sides exactly to what Netta said but I think there's an element of 
paying it forward, you know, putting your hand back to your point, Sam. And, and I would also argue that sponsorship does not have to just happen at, you know, even the higher echelons of an organization. I fully agree. It I can happen agree. throughout. And as long as there's someone more junior than you are around, <laughs> right? There's there's this element and this possibility of sponsorship that, that, you know, I think should be considered, particularly if that person does not look like you or is, mm -hmm. so, is in some way different than you are. Yeah. You know, at Deloitte, actually, uh, we do have a, a at least in uh, in the research and insights area, uh, we we do have a, a formal coaching uh, process where we're assigned folks. You know, I have two women that uh, that I, I've worked with for the past two years from our health solutions center, and uh, it's it just to help them navigate the organization. Deloitte is a partnership that's spread all over the world. It's, some, it's sometimes difficult. To navigate and figuring out like you know where can i go who do i see how do i get something done uh to more you know tangible questions about your day-to-day -day job if you're in the same function i mean how do i handle something like this uh, whether it's partner relations or whether it's research methodologies whatever the case may be um and just to serve as a uh, as a sort of a pressure valve right if somebody is frustrated or or confused uh, about exactly you know how you get ahead in the organization or how the performance review system works or something like that it's a safe space to talk to somebody without saying well i can't really talk to my boss about this i'm afraid to talk to a direct colleague in my own unit because i'm competing with them for the senior manager job you know so that's a little awkward can i is there somebody i can talk to that's been through it and make it uh both a, a formalized process and hopefully it can develop organically as an informal process where you have friends and allies you can depend on, you know. So it's important to encourage this, but it's important also, you know, to have some structure so that, you know, this stuff doesn't always happen spontaneously. And I think that, you know, if you find a balance there, uh, you don't want it to be burdensome. But on the other hand, it, it is part. Of, it should be part of your job to mentor people. And that's some a of great them will be example, others, Sam. Right? That's a great example of being an ally and a supporter and supporting diversity and inclusion in your organization. And I think that we heard a lot today in on the webcast about some of those formal um, goals and programs and structures that are gonna help us get to where we wanna be. And some, and Netta, I appreciate the distinction that you made between mentors and sponsors and peer networks. I think all of those things are so very important. And I would encourage anybody on the phone, um, on the webcast today who has, you know, heard about some of these programs and initiatives, I think most organizations would be receptive to a grassroots effort. If you don't have a formal mentorship or sponsorship program at your organization, start one. You heard Sam talk about, you heard Allison and Netta talk about how they work in their organization. Um, we at the college can serve to be a sounding board. Give us a call, have a conversation about how you might start something grassroots in your organization if you don't have a structured program. One of the questions that came in was, what changes are you seeing in diversity and inclusion programs? And you know, to paraphrase what I think I heard on the webcast today is, I think we have seen a lot of structure where organizations set targets and have goals starting at the top because they want to see that change. Um, we uh, Netta talked about the power of networks and Men as allies is huge. We, we know that, we appreciate you. Thank you for making room for us. Thank you for um, letting us succeed here and, and contributing what we have to contribute. The peer networks internally and externally. And again, um, I have worked with Deloitte on this and other initiatives. They are open, willing, they have great resources. Please, um, if you wanna hit the next slide, I, I, I think did we list all of the the? All right, it'll be in the it'll be in the email. There's a oh, there ton of link. Here we go. This is this is the slide I was talking about. There is so much good research that Deloitte brings to the conversation. Do not hesitate to avail yourself of this and conversations with us and others. Um, and I think you know that will get us to where we want to be in the future, hopefully before 2030, before 2050, sooner than we think. Um, <laughs> we're we're all praying. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 
I'm hoping for some huge accelerant that that changes the uh, changes the trajectory here for all of us. Um, and then the only other thing that I would say is um, I spend a lot of my time thinking about diversity um, in terms of racial and gender diversity. And a lot of what a lot of the points that we made are also um, applicable to racial diversity. So Absolutely. a lot of this will will apply, and I, I quote it often. You know, Hillary, it's it's, it's it, that's a really interesting point. Yes, you don't want to pit the two against each other. It's like, well, you're focusing on gender. What about race? And I remember, you know, the uh, there was a uh, uh, there's been so much about Ruth Bader Ginsburg the last couple of years, and there's that wonderful movie about her life that came out recently, and what a partnership she had with her husband. And they talked about when she got to the ACLU, there was pushback about, well, women don't have it really so bad. And it's, it's really, you know, uh, it's, it, we got to be promoting more the, the race, uh, racial equality issue and women have to wait, you know, and she was pushing saying it's, it, it's not either or it's both, yes. you know, yes. and, uh, you know, that's so on either side, the, you know, there's, there's a lot of ground to be made up on both sides maybe more on the racial side right now than the, than the gender side. But these are, you know, the, these aren't pitted against one another. We're all right. in this together. It's, it's very important for the society and for the company's well-being and future success to promote these in parallel. And uh, you just don't want to get into that sort of an argument about, well, which one do we need to do first? You need to do both. There's a, a saying, lot, right? a rising tide lifts all ships, right? Right. And there's room, there's room for all of us. Um, oh, and by the way, that book I referenced, I don't know if, if folks saw the, uh, the chat, it was called The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote by Elaine Weiss. It's a page turner. It's not, yeah, it's 300 pages. You'll go through it in two or three days. It's just a wonderful, wonderful story. Really gripping drama. All right, before I give the last um, CE code, Robert asked a question about ESG. And um, I just wanna, when you see the replay, Robert, you may have missed it in the beginning. Um, we talked about the external pressures from consumers, from regulatory, and all of those um, investment um, voting, all of those pressures as it relates to ESG and impact investing and sustainability. So yes, that is absolutely, um, definitely uh, in our favor here. So I want to thank our, our guests today, Sam, Netta, and Allison for a wonderful, important conversation. So informative, glad to call you my friends. Again, thank you all for joining us today and have a great afternoon. Thanks for having us.